Okay, so next we'll have uh, uh, Frank Ben uh, from Cornell that tell, telling us about machine learning topology. Thank you very much. Um, so today, uh, thanks for inviting me and to give me this opportunity to speak to the special audience. Today I'll give you an introduction on how we can do machine learning to characterize the classification of different fundamental quantum phases, especially topological phases, and cell problems, which is very difficult and costly from the traditional venue. Sounds to be a very popular topic, but uh, it is really nothing than uh, a special way of doing a regression. So on the left hand side, it's one way of doing the machine learning, but which is actually just one uh, what we have been done doing uh, daily. It's a linear regression. So given a set huge set of data points, and we're drawing a straight line with a certain intersect and the great uh, and the, the gradient. So that. Um, it gives the least square fit, and once we have the square fit, it will have regenerative power, a predictive power. So that we do a future experiment given the horizontal axis of x, and we will have uh, a good knowledge of what the predicted the y axis the output will be. So this kind of uh, thing has been generalized to something we, we, we have been heard daily: the neural net, artificial neural networks. This is mostly known because um, um, the, for the training of artificial neural network. There has been a lot of algorithms through decades of study, such as uh, backpropagation and the stochastic gradient descent. So training of a neural network has been very convenient, especially given by, by, the, by the, uh, the hardware technology that we have, are having today. Um, given a pro problem such that so we're going to write a program which can characterize a handwritten digits, because all of the handwritten digits are not universal, they're handwritten by different people, they have defect, they have noises, um, writing, a, writing a program by ourselves is really difficult. Um, instead, the, what the machine learning do is that to do a regression from the data set that we already have. So that given all of these uh, handwritten data, which we know as a training set, we can write, a, write down a neural network, and then we can fill with the connection of the neural neurons between these new neural networks. So the, the firing conditions can, can change. And we can progressively improve the behavior in the neural network to, map, to make the cost function between the output, the real output and supposed output, as close to, uh, uh, as low as possible. So the answer is as correct as possible. Once that is down, the neural network, with proper control of overfitting, will have predictive power. That is, given additional um, uh, handwritten digit image that it has never seen before, it will be able to make a prediction and, and correctly characterize the, 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 the given uh, the, the handwritten digit. Well, this kind of neural network is very powerful because it has very strong predict, uh, expressive, expressive power, and it's also nonlinear. So it's a function or mapping which can give an output which is nonlinear depending depend on the input. Um, it can also characterize crews, which is hidden within these images, and uh, it can, can, it can uh, handle something which is increasingly a bit data. So why we're doing this for condensed matter? Well, in principle, the spirit of machine learning or an image characterization problem is very compatible with the spirit of condensed matter physics. So if you think about a characterization problem, such as a, um, a handwritten digit or, or image recognition for your car, um, the, the, it's given an input which is, can be very diverse. For example, it can be, have a car, be a car with different background, different color, but we only look at something which is a category. It is a car, which is a universal trait of the output. So in this sense, the problem of characterizing different faces for a many-body input state is very comparable to an uh, image recognition problem. We are not caring for the short distance details of the input many-body state. We're more concerned with what is the actual long distance universality associated with this. OK, so 
given that um, there has been a very uh, recent attempt to use machine learning to characterize the like, index vector spaces, one of the early examples is to uh, using machine learning to characterize the other parameter field of two-dimensional uh, Ising model um, by Roger Malko and his collaborators. And uh, after training with enough examples, the neural network will be able to tell from snapshots from the Pono Monte Carlo or classical Monte Carlo samples whether the whether the model um, is at a temperature below or above or at a critical temperature. Well, this is a pretty cool, and then we want to solve problems which is more. Um, more quantum, for example, and then we immediately face a lot of problems. One of the immediate difficulties is a quantum state is different from classical state in that the Hilbert space of a quantum state is exponentially hard. So the input will be exponentially hard above any capacity of our modern computer technology. Another problem is that for the quantum state, um, you can think of it, it's, it's like a hologram. So it has um, it has a lot of redundancy, and the really relevant part of the quantum state is um, is a very small part of it. So, how to actually make machine learning or with artificial neural network or any other machine learning algorithm to work on quantum states? Well, something that's what we do. That's what we, what we realize is that there there is going to be an intermediate interface that how to connect the traditional machine learning algorithms such as this artificial neural networks and the quantum state of your interest. So what connects a classical thing as a quantum thing? Well, that's going to be operators. So what we propose that we can use operators, not just random operators, um, some informative operators to extract information from the target quantum states. And the op when a quantum operator acting on quantum state, we can see numbers. And that's very, that can be organically connected to artificial neural networks. Uh, once this connection is completed, everything that has been developed in the recent decades can be directly applied to this kind of architecture and make machine learning happen for quantum states, especially topological phases matter. Topological phase is extremely, extremely interesting for this type of algorithm due to, partially due to its lack of all the parameter, so it's, it's very hard to characterize. And uh, also, um, the topological states is very discrete. It has a discrete index, like Z2 or Z index. So it is, in some sense, um, very similar to the head written digit equalization. So it is very realistic, and it, it has the need to do to, to use um, architecture like this, because if we really look at something like the topological gamma entropy, the cost will be pretty astonishing, as I'll show you later in my comparison. Okay, so uh, I haven't told you how to choose the correct uh, operator to be informative. This is crucial because if we consider all of the operator you can define for a point state, it's also exponential. That's not, not going to work. But let me just show you, uh, first of all, uh, if we choose the right set of operator and how it's going to help us. So this is an example. We write down a two-dimensional lattice model uh, which interpolate between a chain slayer, which is the pi square lattice pi form space, and a tributary slayer, so for, uh, with a tuning parameter kappa. So for the limit where kappa equals zero, they become two length letters, which is a trivial insulator. For, for the uh, case where kappa equals 0.1, this is a, uh, this is a, a the pi flux square lattice model, and it has a chain number one, so it's a topological insulator. And uh, what we do is that uh, we use operators, which is a two-point correlation, uh, two-point correlator um, that has a triangle. So we, we, the operator we care is a two-point correlation between R i and R j, R j and R k, and R k and R i, R i, and use these two operators. With these operators as our, uh, uh, so the reason we choose this operator is the following. Here's an example. So because we're going to ask the question whether this is a quantum call phase, whether this is a chain insulator. So what what is can be the vital characteristic for the quantum call phases? Well, we know that uh, um, for quantum call phase or chain insulator, the the, mo the most vital response will be the quantized call response, the whole conductivity. Now, let's go one step further. So if 
how connectivity will be the solution of our um, goal, of final goal. So how, what are the operators that contribute to that? So we know for non-interacting fermions on a square lattice, or for a generic uh, um, lattice, uh, the sigma xy can be written down in this expression. So we know um, here S, that S i j k is the area of the triangle um, defined by the three vertices, and p j k, p k l, p l j are just two point correlations. So this expression, we can immediately tell why S when the area of the triangle is non-generic, uh, the information related to the sigma xy must be encoded in the operator pjk, pkl, and plj. So we will use these operators as our operator to extract information from the polling state when we're asking a question whether we're regarding this whole, whole when we're regarding this topological whole uh, quote-unquote nature. And we can even further reduce the cost for our calculation. For example, we're not going to include all of the triangle operators, um, but basically limit the size of triangles. Um, this is given by the, uh, by the intuition that uh, for gapped quantum hot states, all two point correlations are exponentially decaying. So we let's just focus on the smallest triangles and see whether that has adequate data for making the correct, correct decision. Another important uh, um, approximation and also improvement we make is that we are not going to use expectation value for these operators, but we'll actually do a more kernel sampling and we're using more kernel snapshot of these operators to make a decision. On one hand, this is very efficient because now if this works, given just one snapshot of in our thermalized Monte Carlo Markov chain, we can make a decision immediately. On the other hand, which I can uh, do to time that I will not be able to tell, is that uh, snapshots of Monte Carlo will have information not about just about these uh, uh, operators, but also about the correlation between different operators, which is, is very important when we will we will eventually go to strongly interacting phases. Okay, so given that type of operators, and we have operators not just on one side, but this type of operator that traverse the entire system size. We, now we can make an architecture in this way, and uh, the, the operators extract acting on the component state, and it eventually turns the information of the component state into classical image with extra dimensions, and which can eventually and subsequently be conquered by artificial neural networks. And in, we first train a neural network with examples that we are confident with. For example, exactly solvable models or models with a large gap limits, where we have certainty about its topological or trivial nature. Once that is down, we can invert the direction of the information flow for some intermediate value of, uh, of the model. Uh, where we do not have a comfortable small parameter, and then we just input the quantum state and treat it with this uh, operator that we call quantum loop topography, and the neural network will process the information if it tells you, tells you an output regarding the topological nature of the state. Okay, so here is the example of the previous, uh, sorry, output result of the previous example I showed you, which uh, is the, uh, the neural network, neural network the output of uh, uh, um, the, the translator normally is their transition. So this is a non tracking model, so we know the answer exactly, and the transition is supposed to be at half equals 0 0.5. We see that when the gap is large for the uh, for either the normal insulator and the hall insulator, we have very good accuracy of almost 100%. Uh, and the neural net will be, be consistently telling you the right uh, nature of the uh, of the couple, whether it's a topological insulator or it's a normal insulator. And especially even during the transition, near the transition, where the neural network is getting somewhat confused, which is normal given that we're actually doing a truncation to the correlation length, to, to the correlator, uh, to the range of correlation where it's rooted. If we zoom in, we find a sharp jump uh, in the neural output, so the neural network still realizes there's a sharp singularity. Something happens across the transition. So that, so in other words, in the, this type of method, we can accurately pinpoint not only the phase but also the location of the, uh, the phase transition uh, in a very efficient manner. This, these all depend on single snapshot of the operators that we just mentioned. And 
Um, as a digression, if we do not choose the right set operator, which is relative equivalent to the question we're asking, let's say we use just the electron uh, number operators on each side, that, that doesn't work. For example, if you use the electron number operator, the result that we show is the red dots we are showing right here. And what it tells us is that, well, um, it's probably tells, telling us that uh, there's some symmetry, rotation symmetry breaking. So for the case at cover equals 0 0.1, and uh, the, the model actually has a special C4 rotation symmetry. So that is relative to the electron number operator, and that's probably what's kept being captured over there. So right, asking the right question and choosing the right operator is the key. But if you, if you consider a multiband multi model, then also this observation will be relevant. It will tell you about the number of bands, occupied bands. Yes. Okay, so here is one more application. So we've gone one step further and to study a top fractional chain insulator. So I didn't show you more detail, but this fractional insulator is obtained by part of construction, and we are certain. So um, we've studied that in the small kappa and large kappa limit, it is indeed a normal insulator, and the fractional chain insulator is <coughs> And now we train a neural network using the same set of uh, operators and, uh, and the same, same set of architecture. Um, remember, this is a strongly correlated topological phase. So the chain insulator, I'm sorry, chain number or sigma xy formula is no longer applicable here. But we're, let's say the, it's still the same set of operators that's relevant to this, uh, uh, this fractional chain insulators. And we use these operators as our interface. And the result is shown right, in, right here, and we have a transition for um, um, between a normal insulator and a fraction chain insulator. And we can also detect the three full degenerate ground state on a torus. And for all of those three ground states, we see a sharp transition at somewhere around the value of our, our benchmark. So again, this only takes very few uh, snapshots of Monte Carlo of the operator. So what's, what's the Hamiltonian? Uh, this doesn't have a Hamiltonian, but the main field Hamiltonian is the chain insulator Hamiltonian. So we take the chain insulator Hamiltonian, we solve for the, for the, uh, we solve for the, uh, the ground state, and then we do a pardon construction, a projected construction. Oh, it's a wave function. It's oh, a wave function. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Left side is a chain insulator or a trivial insulator? Uh, left hand side is a chain, uh, is a trivial insulator. How can you go from trivial insulator to fractional chain insulator? Okay, so this is a projected construction. In other words, we just uh, consider the previous example, which is a normal insulator and bono cone insulator, and uh, now we just take the cube of the wave function. We take the cube wave of the wave function for a chain insulator. It's um, it's like going from in integer bono hall to uh, the long wave function, and uh, in this case. And uh, we know in the large gap example, if you take the, the cube of a fraction of, of an integer chain insulator, and it behaves like a fraction chain insulator in, in terms of the topological nature. Then, like this normal insulating phase and fractional chain insulating phase, a different electron density. They have they have exactly the same electron density. <coughs> oh, it's clear. Hmm? Oh, it's clear. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, 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 so the machine was uh, pre-trained to do what? Okay, so uh, the machine has trained our examples at uh, top like 0.0, 0 and 1.0, and then we asked it was what what are the interpolation? So, 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 so we told the machine one side is rational, the other side is normal. Yes. Okay. And for these examples, we have. Um, Certainty about what are the topological nature because we can we did the topology entanglement studies uh -huh. on these phases, okay. and uh, right. And the bench, so the bench for example for the benchmark we can do a topology entanglement entropy studies or study the, the how many ground what the degeneracy of the ground states, and these are much much more costly to evaluate than just uh, taking snapshots of the operators that you just mentioned. Okay, so here is the uh, before ending. So um, let me give you an example why this uh, um, can actually help us a little bit. So for topological phases matter, for ma many of uh, the audience, well, we have been studying the topological phases using either topological quantum field theory or construct uh, 
um, exactly so about bottles on the lattice. While that is co very, very cool, um, in our uh, in practice, um, we, we're usually in Dalit with uh, examples where it's not exactly so about, for example, take the Coracle model and, and apply an electric, uh, an external magnetic field, and the model is no longer exactly solvable. It also induced, uh, uh, introduced a finite correlation as for forcing, forcing particles. And, uh, and also in our measurements, we have a discrete lattice. So the topological top field theory does not exactly apply there and because of the short, shortest nature of the discrete lattice. In also, also in measurement, we will have cutoff and fluctuation of uncertainty. If we're measuring something like a swap operator who calculate an impact entropy, which is a very exponentially small operator, um, the swap op the expectation value operator, uh, expectation value of the swap operator is exponentially small in terms of the uh, the subregion, the size of the subregion. So the in order to suppress the such. Uh, um, fluctuation of certainty in the measurement, the cost will be very high. So in this is what we do traditionally. So why the traditionally we have we compare we compare the, the specific model, the more generic model, um, with our understanding in the exact solvable limit and TQFT in the long wave lenses. For example, we, that's why we go to, when we calculate the topological time entropy, we need the subsystem size to be larger than the correlation. And, uh, um, when, or we can talk about the Wilson loop, whether it's area law or whether it's volume law. Now we need to go to large system size across half of the system to see whether it is decaying exponentially with, with respect to the volume or the, 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 or the parameter. This is just comparing the, the long distances where the short distance nature of these uh, um, lattice models does not matter anymore. Well, this is really cool, but sometimes this can be very costly, and sometimes we just do not have a solution that, that we have to have. So using the techniques that we just mentioned in the architecture, um, what we do is that uh, we use the continue, we, we use the, direct, the, the, the limit and low wavelengths to make a pre-selection of operators that matter. For example, the, 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 the triangle operator or the Wilson loop operators for the Z2 topological phases, etc. But we, but we do not know um, what is the connection between these operators in the short, in the noisy limit. Uh, what's the connection of these operators to the, to the result for the, the Z2 index of that we want it? So what we do is that so we do a, a first step. We choose the operators, right line of operators. And then we use machine learning to do the do the do the, 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 the heavy lifting, and uh, it can, the machine learning is very good at the being when it's trained on noisy data and it knows what is the universal, what is the essential part of the information that's hidden in this data and make the right selection. Okay, so uh, let me acknowledge my collaborators, and uh, with that, I thank you for the session. Any questions? All right. So, yeah. So you, yeah. I mean, it always uh, confuses me. So, 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 if you train your system on a square lattice and you, you, you try it on on different lattices, does so does it work? Does the machine still? That's that's a very good question. Sorry for not getting into that detail. Um, if you train on a square lattice, it's going to fail fail on a hot con lattice because um, it's not it's never going to go be smarter than what you offer it. In other words, but on the other hand, if you train uh, the data that comes from square lattice and hot column lattice, and uh, if you train with data from both examples, and the, the, the following, sorry, the eventual, the, the final architecture will work on both. And to be to be better, you can offer examples, for example, you, you, you're your example is not symmetry protected. It only depends on how much index, not the actual symmetry. You just offer all kinds of lattice, it even broken, even broken symmetry, translation symmetry by this order, etc., etc. Yeah, but then you then they, they need a lot of training. Then you need a lot of training. Um, but the, now, then you will have a product, an architecture that can detect the corresponding topological phases for example, which you use earlier, um, whatever architecture or lattice. Yeah, 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 I'm just wondering whether the machine really learns the uh, 
the essence of the topological phase or not, the topological phase. The essence is that it does not depend on lattice at all. So if the machine is only trained to do what, what it does on square lattice, maybe maybe what it learned is not really the essence of topological order. It learns something else. Uh, oh, you're saying it's actually looking at uh, the square lattice symmetry? Yeah, for example. For example, it's, uh, it's, uh, so for example, the way it looks for the phase transition is actually not the, uh, for example, the topological entanglement entropy. It's actually looking for something, some local information that actually works only on the square lattice instead of on the general graph uh, or general lattice. Uh, well, that's totally avoidable by just increasing the, the training. diversity of the training. Yeah. And um, and uh, we actually for our architecture, one of the benefits we do is that uh, we do not need super compact art artificial neural network. That gives our surprise interpretability for the for change layer case. And this change layer case, we will be able to tell what are the eventual formula for the the for making the decision. And that's indeed the, the change layer index formula. Okay, I suggest that we postpone further discussions for lunch and thank all the speakers of the session.